We'll now transition to the next panel, which will be moderated by Prashant Shukla. So Prashant, if you want to come on camera, I'll introduce you. Uh, Prashant and I have uh, worked together over many years, me back to my U.S. Uh, geological survey days, Prashant back to his government of Canada days in uh, uh, geomatics and mapping. Um, and then since uh, both of our retirements, we both actually spent a little time, me still there with WGIC, uh, Prashant did some policy work for us. And Prashant, you are the one that, uh, in addition to just the conversations that I had with Jeff leading up to this, of course, I've known Jeff for a long time. Uh, you probably are uh, one of the few people that spoke to him right down uh, the home stretch and talked about the energy and leadership that he's exerted globally for this. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you first to manage your own panel. And then I know after that panel, uh, you'll be going into a uh, more thorough discussion on uh, Jeff's work and his legacy. So Bar Barb you, and Prashant. Oh, Bar yeah, Barb and, and Prashant. Barb yep, and Prashant, right sorry right to in. interrupt. Let's go no, ahead and no. just quickly display those poll results. Maybe you can take a quick look at them, all right? Great, do I? Oh, okay, good. We do have them. So uh, industry, uh, almost half the audience is from industry. That's great from a WGIC perspective. And then it looks like we're fairly uh, equally distributed between local, state, a little bit less for federal government, a little bit less for academia, and then 13% from uh, some other group. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and geographically, do we have poll results in? Just scroll down a little bit on your screen there on the, on the poll. Okay, thanks. Uh, oh, was this, okay, this is uh, thematically that I'm looking at. Geez, nobody from agriculture, a little bit from energy, transportation, water, utilities, and other. So utilities and uh, transportation, uh, biggest, maybe no surprise there because of... Um, uh, the underground infrastructure piece, um, and then bulk, 83% from the United States, uh, good showing from Canada, a little bit South America, Europe, a little bit Africa, thank you, both South America and Africa, and uh, some good present representation from Asia. Thanks, everyone, for doing that. Uh, very much appreciate it. Okay, Prashant, over to you. I'll go back on mute and off camera. Thank you so much, Barb, and thank you to the previous panelists for an exceptional discussion. I wanted to thank everybody for uh, coming and attending today, <clears throat> and I'm um, uh, coming to you from Blustery, Ottawa, which was Jeff Zeiss's home area, and, uh, an er and from where he pushed a lot of knowledge and uh, activity relating to underground infrastructure and the mapping of underground infrastructure. We have an industry <coughs> solution um, panel. I'm very pleased to have Wes Kaiser shot, who's the national market leader from WGI Inc. Nicholas Smilowski from Geospatial Solutions at Bad Elf, who are also one of our sponsors. Joseph Vladi from Lux Modus, the CEO and co-founder. Jason Spar, uh, GIS analyst from GTI Energy, and Simeon Katiliev, who is the GNSS specialist and researcher at GTI Energy. One of the things that I'd like to do is I'd ask Wes to come on so that I can hand off to him, and then uh, we can move into uh, various discussions. And each of the panelists will be introducing subsequent panelists uh, so that we have a fairly seamless and fast and easy approach to things. So with that, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to introduce our esteemed panel and over to you, Wes. Thank you again, Prashant, for the introduction. Again, my name is Wes Kaiserschott with WGI Inc. Um, we're a firm nationwide uh, with, with our headquarters out of uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, I'm in Austin, Texas. And uh, as Prashant mentioned, national market lead for not only subsurface utility engineering, but also um, other geospatial services that we have at WGI, including aerial LIDAR, 
and um, land surveying services that we can um, um, help in the collection of this data that can now go into uh, the un underground digital twins uh, technologies that are coming. I saw some of the questions that maybe weren't fully answered yet. Um, and I will be around for the networking session later of how the data is actually collected. Hopefully this presentation here will, will answer some of that and how this data that becomes a 3D model underground and then gains some intelligence into a digital twin uh, is actually collected geophysically. I wanted to start with um, a, a quick little history of Sue and then a quick poll. Before I go to the slide after that, I wanna put a quick poll up. Um, Sue stands for Subsurface Utility Engineering and it looks like the poll has begun and this would be great. Um, while I'm going over this uh, history of Sue, let's go ahead and um, vote on this poll question. It, and, and it kind of helps me understand who's, who's all watching this and uh, the familiarization with subsurface utility engineering. But the history of it, um, some people think it's a very relatively new service in the civil engineering, transportation, land development uh, world. However, in the 1980s uh, is actually when two new technologies started, including air vacuum excavation and surface geophysics. And in 1981, a firm on the East Coast of the United States began what is now considered Sioux. It didn't have that name until later on. In the 1990s, uh, it, it actually then began to take off because Federal Highway Administration started promoting it. And Purdue University did a study in 1999 that showed a cost benefit ratio of investing $1 in Sioux during the design phase of roadways and other infrastructure projects could save almost $5 later in claims um, and in right-of-way utility delays uh, on the project. So it really started catching wind in the 90s as certain DOTs began using it as test pilots. In 2000s, then it really started to expand around the country and around the world. I was very impressed to see what's happening in Singapore with our uh, previous uh, panel host. Um, that was very impressive. So it, it really did begin to spread around the world. And it was recognized as an engineering practice when the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, developed the 38 standard, which uh, standardizes Sue across the nation, depending on what firm you are or what state you're in or where you are. Now today, uh, we're actually in uh, even, even more with this digital twin technology. I'm going to try to get a little better pointer here. In our digital twin technology discussions today, it's very exciting what's going on today in Sue. 3D modeling, turning into this when you're adding now intelligence to that 3D model. Uh, conflict analysis, which is really part of coordination, but understanding what you have underground in that 3D model and then seeing how it conflicts with the proposed roadway or building improvements and to see where those clash analysis points are. And then very exciting for those of us in the Sioux profession, uh, which I think uh, a number of people are on this call in the audience, is that um, about a month ago, the updated standard came out and that was a 20 year wait. So it was the 3802 from 2002 when the standard was first established. And now we have 2022, a long 20 year wait um, and it's published now on the ASC library. 75-22 uh, also came along with that update, which is really key in the utility as built. Uh, many, many state DOTs are wanting their utility information in a database now um, where when the next project comes along um, in, for instance, Colorado or Texas or Florida or Illinois, uh, they'll know where their utilities are rather than having to uh, scurry for, for records and maybe not get exactly what they need uh, up front and have more delays. Before we go to the next slide, which will answer the poll question, do we have some results? We have some very smart people on this call. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, but it's also really exciting, too, that not everyone on the call is a Sioux expert because how cool it is that we get to learn something new 
in, in the geophysical world and the geospatial world. So very good. The correct answer is four. Pardon me as I try to advance my slides there. Okay, they are called the Sioux quality levels. If you think of quality levels as levels of certainty, in other words, how certain are you where that utility is located underground? Quality level D begins, and it's the least certain of the four levels because you're really gathering records. You're counting on records. You're counting on a site visit. You're counting on maybe an 811 damage prevention call where they'll go out and flag the utilities and mark, um, which is not sue, but it is damage prevention and it does get you a understanding of who's there. A quality level D gets you that level of certainty. The next quality level is C. Now at this point, um, and, and we'll see some pictorials of what these levels look like here in a moment. But at, at this point, now you're surveying in some features. You've, you, you found a fire hydrant. You found some manholes. Um, you found, um, you've maybe found some fiber optic um, type uh, communication lids in, in the middle of the street. And, and, and now you know where these lines are at that point. And then that segment of utility that is modeled or uh, put into CAD is quality level C because now you have some tie points. You have a you have an anchor point with that with that survey. Quality level B begins a more precise location because now you're using ge geophysical methods. What are those? Um, traditionally, it's been electromagnetic pipe and cable locating, ground penetrating radar, uh, which we've talked a bit a bit um, already with with panel one. Um, some of the newer technologies, uh, thermal imaging. Um, other kind of radio waves going in the ground, um, more more improved ground penetrating radar uh, that's high speed and, and three dimensional uh, and, and can be mapped at roadway speeds rather than just a push cart method, which traditionally was used in the past. So many of that. You're, so you're actually now depicting it within a very um, small uh, level of uncertainty. Usually you're within now a foot or maybe even within six inches um, and most times right on that pipe or part of that pipe. So you've discovered it at a quality level B. Quality level A is even better because now a vacuum excavation truck, which a uh, number on this call might not know what that is, but fear not, we'll see a picture of that here soon. You're going out and you're seeing now the utility to its three dimensions in the X, Y, and Z because you've actually non-destructively excavated down to the top of pipe and you can daylight it, you can see it, you can uh, fill out a sheet of attributes and actually develop a test troll report, which you'll see an example of as well. So again, four quality levels. So good job to the 83% that got that right. And the others, um, this is a really cool um, to, to have you on the call to learn more about Sue. Quality level D, again, the least certain. Yes, you can gather records, you can map it. This adds some value to a DOT, to a highway engineer. It adds some value. It, it adds a lot of value. If you're doing an environmental report, for instance, you at least know which utilities are there, whereabouts they are, where you can decide maybe the alignment of this uh, interstate highway. Field visits, an 811 call. Again, quality level D is a records only based. Quality level C, we talked about. This is a picture of what some of these above ground features of the utility are sometimes called appurtenances whether it's a fiber optic communication marker, whether it's natural gas markers, whether it is a water valve cover or a water manhole uh, lid that you see. Now that you survey in this point and you survey in this point, they are anchor points. And now you can display that utility between the points to the certainty of quality level C. Even better quality levels like we talked about with B and A, you're seeing, in a, you're seeing an example here of why you don't rely just on an 811 call. What's an 811 call? In the United States, all 50 states are uh, ha have kind of a governmental state funding where if you just dial 811, um, not 911, but 811, you will get, uh, and you tell where the project is, you will get a mapping of the utilities. Not a mapping, but you'll get a a location with with paint and flags in the ground. Many have done this when they maybe install a sprinkler system in their yard. What happened here was 
we were, um, our company was tasked to find a water line near a railroad track south of Indi Indianapolis, Indiana. And this blue line represented where the 811 ticket called the location of the water line. And you can see here where our technicians actually found the water line. Now that distance of a foot or two, it doesn't seem like very much, but it could be very uh, detrimental if you're designing um, some kind of uh, a roadway feature that that's going to get in the way. And that two feet can be very valuable right away space. So Sue is defined also as a very professional standard of care. Um, and that's why there's an ASCE standard of, of how you deal with the collection of the data of the utilities and where they're located. This is a vacuum excavation truck. So what you're seeing here is before we decided that that was a good place to dig a hole and cut through the pavement, we did quality level B to designate that water line. And that gave our crew the certainty to go ahead and excavate uh, down to it. And that's where we found the water line. Again, this was an 811 ticket. It did show us that we were in the right neighborhood, if you will, but here we found it through the professional standard of care of subsurface utility engineering. Here's what a deliverable looks like. Now we're talking about 3D modeling and digital twins a lot today, but, but really in the beginning and what a, what a lot of clients still find valuable enough is a 2D quality level B deliverable. Uh, but we're finding that it's not enough and a lot of DOTs are really going towards the 3D, but I just wanted to show you what a 2D deliverable is. Um, and you can see a good layout. You can see where the roadways are. You can see where the utilities are. They're color coded as to whether they're a water line, whether a fiber optic, whether they're a natural gas, whether they're an electric, buried or overhead. You can get electronic depths. You can see this is an electronic depth of plus or minus six and a half feet is where our instruments show that that water main was uh, buried. Um, again, you can't count on that until you actually excavate down, but there is uh, there are instruments that show you approximate depths. So when you get to the quality level A, here's a little bit more of a zoom of what was going on there in Indianapolis. When you get down to it, you can see, you know, saw cutting of the pavement occurs, then you get down, and you can actually, then we excavate down. And this is what the Sioux profession does when, when, uh, when tasked with quality level A, you're exposing that pipeline. Now you get to take the diameter of that pipeline. You get to see the material it's made of. You get to see the depth. Now you have a lot of, you have a lot of attributes. Not only do you have the XYZ coordinates, but you have a lot of other attributes as well, the material type. Uh, the active status is maybe not exactly certain. However, you could hot tap into this if you expose it like that and see if that uh, line is active or not um, and, and, and these other kind of uh, attributes. Now, when you do a, a test hole, then you, you, you get one of these reports and the Sioux standard talks about uh, Sioux reports. And this is one for, for one test hole where you get aerial images, you get some um, pictorial of what that utility configuration looked like. In this case, it was a multi-duct um, system. And then you get pictures of it and you can see where the crews actually measured down and then it was surveyed in later if the client needed that. So how are we collecting this data? This is kind of, a, this, this is kind of what we do at WGI. We're, we're a full geospatial firm. We are collecting data, not only on ground level with trucks and crews, we're collecting it in the air with fixed wing, high imagery calibrated um, uh, sensors. Um, I, I, I know um, our, our, our host from Singapore showed Leica as one of the companies. There's, there's Regal, there's Leica, there's, there's others out there that are providing that fixed to the aircraft, providing very high uh, density uh, imagery, even picking up where you're marking the utilities. Uh, the, the LiDAR technology does. Here's a drone. You can certainly fix a camera to a drone as well. Here, here's, here's somewhere you can put it out on the water and get some information as well. Um, here's some Sioux being done and then, you know, a picture of what you can find underground. And here's, here's traditional land surveying techniques that are going on too. This is a lot of ways to actually capture that data that can then be modeled, that, that can be turned into a digital twin. And this is just a picture of what we can do aerial imagery. This is not a picture above a railroad yard. This is actually 
millions and millions of points of LIDAR being beamed and then extracted into a, a from cloud data extracted into a model and how that looks even like a photo, but that's just a lot of points extracted into a model. We saw some very impressive things there in um, on, on some of our previous panels work where the, the work was being modeled there. I believe that was also in Singapore. You can see how these LIDAR points also will collect even the top of rail from a plane thousands of feet up in the air. This happens to be a G2 sensor by a company called Teledyne, and this actually will fix to an aircraft and capture this information from the air. These are elevation points from low elevation in blue to high elevation in red. A lot of information being captured there. And you can see how more data can be captured um, using, using LiDAR technology. All this can then be um, used to model and then the data fed in as our uh, panelist from New York City has uh, described into a very valuable digital twin. So oh so close. This is the deliverable that WGI did recently for a client where we took LIDAR above ground and did a building information model, a BIM of the building and everything above ground. And the client then wanted also the utilities mapped underground in reference to it. So they got a full picture of, of above and below ground. So imagine adding intelligence to this natural gas line or this electric line. And by intelligence, that means what's the flow rate? What's the pressure in that water line? Well, that digital twin then, where the digital twin of information can then be used with the actual representation of what's out there for like a, for like a natural gas company or, or a public works company of, of, a, of a city or town. So a deliverable here of 3D Sioux gets you oh so close to the next step of developing a digital twin. My last slide here, the possibilities are now and credit here to an Esri site. All of us have heard of Esri, I'm sure. And this photo comes from them. So here's an, here's an idea of water lines mapped to two dimension. And then you have, now you have some modeling above ground. And this is just the type of thing now where that digital twin can show you tank capacities, it can show you pressures, it can show you line outs here, uh, layouts here of, of where it is, you know, within this part of a city uh, in the vicinity geospatially where, where you have all this data due to, due to the modeling of utilities. So that is my presentation. You can't do any of this stuff without being able to have good survey and, and good data collected very closely. It doesn't do any good. And so I turn this over now to, to Nick uh, with Bad Elf. Thanks, Wes. I really appreciate it. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So uh, in my short little presentation slot here, I am going to discuss anchoring the digital twin dot, dot, dot in reality what I'd like to call XYZ marks the spot. Um, thank you everybody uh, that's joining us today and attending. Uh, we appreciate your time. Also thanks to all of the uh, presenters and sponsors and guests and hosts. Uh, this has been a great event so far. It's a hard act to follow. There's been some really good, great presentations, but I think you will quickly see uh, how Bad Elf uh, fits into this world of the digital twin and smart cities. Uh, and we'll, again, be talking specifically today about anchoring the twin. So we'll do a quick introduction to Bad Elf. So if you have not heard of Bad Elf, we'll tell you who we are. Uh, we'll quickly discuss our GNSS technology, specifically our Bad Elf Flex. And you can see the, uh, the cowgirl on the right-hand side spinning the GPS devices. We'll discuss anchoring the twin, and I'll uh, leave you with XYZ marks the spot. So who is Bad Elf? Uh, if you've not heard of us, Bad Elf is a line of GNSS receivers. We work with primarily GIS and survey professionals uh, to collect high accuracy data. Uh, we are in what is called the BYOD, bring your own device space. And so we're a little bit of an alternative low cost uh, GNSS solution to some of the uh, bigger dogs that have been on the market uh, for decades and decades. We are about 13 years old and uh, we interact with a plethora of different types of software packages, uh, ranging from utilities and engineering to GIS, to mapping, to aviation, to marine. We'll, we'll take a look there. We also uh, like to dance with all of the devices out there. So Apple, Android, and Windows. 
All of our receivers have integrated LCD screens and intuitive user interfaces. This is something a little different than a lot of the other GNSS or global navigation satellite system or uh, satellite system providers. Um, we like to have a screen on there so you, our users can really see the metadata, what's happening underneath the hood as you're collecting, but also uh, have the ability to use the buttons to collect right off the device. Uh, originally, when we got formed about 13 years ago, we were primarily in the aviation industry. Fun fact, if you are talking to a private pilot or a commercial pilot, there's about a 30 to 40 percent chance that they have a bad ELF GPS in their cockpit. So we've been ha ha helping millions of people fly uh, safely around the world for over a decade. We've also been in the marine industry. We uh, work in the recreational sports industry. So if you're a golfer, or a hunter, um, a fisherman. Um, but most importantly for what we're talking about today is this GIS mapping, AEC, you know, architectural engineering, consulting, land surveying, engineering, Sioux, land development. This is all sort of wrapped in together. Uh, this is our most recent segment of business and sort of been evolving to get here. Uh, what you see on the screen here is one of our GNSS devices. We have several, but this is our flagship device. It is a fully survey grade, low cost alternative, quad constellation, multi-frequency, it has all the bells and whistles of uh, a GPS device that is extremely ruggedized, easy to use, um, and, and a little different because you can even tell that the shape right away doesn't look probably like your traditional hamburger GPS uh, due to the fact that we use a helical antenna. The key here is that the Bad Elf Flex will get you a centimeter or better accuracy all day, every day for uh, one of the lowest costs on the market. And this is really the crux of the presentation today that we need accuracy. So if you were to look at a normal cul-de-sac uh, in a neighborhood in the United States, you could estimate about 10 meters would be uh, the circumference of the circle. And as you go in through those uh, uh, concentric rings, uh, you get to higher and higher accuracy. And so, um, some say GIS or mapping grade GPS devices, one meter or, uh, or or worse, or let's say your cell phone, for an example, it is not going to be able to map the data accurately enough to anchor the digital twin effectively. This is where it's a it's a it's kind of this Goldilocks uh, situation in which we want to have the porridge exactly correct. The better the accuracy, the better the model, right? And so we really want to. Uh, start, if you're not doing it already in your organization, collecting high accuracy data. Um, we've are obviously seen a presentation from New York that was great in Singapore. These are major metropolitan areas with a ton of infrastructure under the ground. If we don't start mapping these things with high accuracy and precision, uh, we're going to have accidents. And so this is an example, Royal Oaks. This was in Michigan. It's a few years old at this point, um, but a gas line was hit and there was loss of life and millions of dollars worth of damage. We're not going back in time, right? So the underground is only going to get more complex, more complicated, more packed in there. And so we need to start really utilizing some of those new Sioux standards and mapping standards being rolled out to highly understand authoritatively where our underground infrastructure is. Uh, here's another example. This is from about five months ago. This is a post hole digger uh, that accidentally hits a gas line. Uh, luckily, this person uh, survived. Um, but this is another great example that even in a rural area, like on a farm, if we don't know where the utilities are underneath, uh, that's a huge safety issue. And you know, that that's only part of the pie, right? If you were to do a Venn diagram of all of this, we need to also understand that the digital twin, BIM, smart cities, that's also on planning and management. It's the 4D, 5D, 6D, money, time, uh, and the management of systems, not just the safety. So there's so much involved with the digital twin. To understand why accuracy is important, right? So GPS or GNSS provides a location, an X, Y, and Z. We've seen that in some of these presentations. Without a accurate X, Y, and Z to start, everything else downstream of that initial point or what surveyors or geodesists will often call the point of beginning. It's the first point of the survey that anchors everything. There are two concepts called with accuracy. There is absolute accuracy and precision. These are both important things that your GPS or GNSS device needs to provide. Uh, absolute accuracy is how good is your model to the real world, right? So if you have a location in your model 
It, how close is that location in the model to the real location on the Earth? Precision, though, is a little different, but also extremely important. It is the repeatability or the precision within a single data set. So instead of worrying about the real world, what I care about is what if I'm measuring from one end of the pipe to the other end of the pipe within the data set? Is there drift? Is there is there margin of error? So both precision, repeatability, and absolute accuracy, how good we are into the earth, is really important for the digital twin. So Bad Elf, we create, again, super affordable GPS that provides that initial XYZ. Whether you're using Basin Rover or you're collecting utilities above ground or using drones, all of these situations require an original X, Y, and Z. Some new drones, for an example, you may be thinking, well, this is an underground. Well, e you still have to have an X, Y, Z established to go either above or below ground. You could be flying a drone. You set control with your GPS from Bad Elf, and the drone could be using um, uh, radar, right? And so there's actual um, ground penetrating radar on drones now. So you can see here the GPS in different uh, modes, drones and, and lasers and base and rover. We've got uh, GPR devices attached to our Bad Elf Flex. So now you're, you know, again, scanning underneath the earth. Uh, but if you scan underneath the earth and you don't know where that is in relation to other objects within uh, your project area or to the real world, this is a problem, right? Um, ground penetrating radar, it will help you find these locations of uh, items under the ground or assets under the ground. But if you don't have a good establishment above the ground, that's it's all hogwash, right? Like you can have a great model, but if it doesn't fit appropriately, it's not truly intelligent. Here's a great example in Queen Creek, Arizona, um, a customer of ours that literally uh, attached their Bad Elf Flex to a, um, an e-bike and a GoPro camera with Esri ArcGIS field maps. And as they ride around the city and collect water mains and other valves and other type of uh, utility infrastructure, they are collecting it with uh, extremely high accuracy of a centimeter or better you know, uh, data. So you can be collecting remote sensing with drones and LIDAR and GPR, or you can be going to assets one by one. You could be opening up a trench and putting uh, GPS down in the trench. You could be doing directional drilling uh, and, and following the line of the drill with GPS. Or as Wes mentioned earlier, if you've got 811 coming out to your site and they're spray painting uh, where the utilities are, you could actually start mapping where those utilities are uh, being placed by the locators. And in fact, uh, we have uh, our Bad Elf Flex that uh, pairs just fine with some locators. So now that 811 is actually doing mapping and it's storing that mapping into a database. So XYZ marks the spot. Keep in mind, crud in is crud out. If you don't start with a good uh, lat long and elevation, the rest of your model will not be good. I promise you. Uh, you've got to start with a good point of beginning, right? You don't want crud in. You you want you want magic in, magic out. The twi digital twin begs you, please, right? Like start using high accuracy precision, keeping in mind that accuracy is addictive, but it's extremely important, especially when we're talking about utilities and confined spaces. You've got to have a established authoritative XYZ. And that's what I've got. So I am introducing our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Joseph. And um, he's coming from us from a little bit of a different perspective. But if Joseph, you could go ahead and turn on your camera, I will stop my screen share, uh, but Lux Modus will talk to you a little bit about the software side of the world. And Joseph, it's all you. All right, thanks, Nick. A really interesting presentation. <clears throat> and thanks everyone for, for joining and for uh, the panelists today for presenting um, their solutions and being, uh, being available. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, so yeah, so I'm, my name is Joseph Pilati and I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of of Lux Modus, and we are a hardware-enabled SaaS uh, company providing um, rapid 3D um, mapping of uh, infrastructure assets. Um, uh, we started in the pipeline industry um, here being in, in Alberta, and we quickly expanded to the other large linear uh, asset um, uh, uh, market verticals, uh, particularly power lines uh, and rail road. And an integral part or, uh, you know, a, a key part of, of any linear assets are uh, subsurface utilities. And of course, the above ground utilities, but here we're here today to talk about Sioux. Um, 
the background of LexModus is that we found uh, all of us founders came from the construction industry for utilities, um, particularly large um, uh, transmission systems for power and and and, um, uh, and for pipelines, um, but still utilities uh, nonetheless. And um, we were always um, like many people. Sorry, I jumped ahead there. Many people uh, in the industry frustrated by the traditional data collection methods, which we're all talking about today. Um, Bad Elf is a, is a great example of bringing technology to the field um, to improve the methods, but traditional methods of collecting utility data and subsurface data is slow, uh, it's expensive, it can be very hazardous at times, especially um, more on the pipeline side and in northern climates and so forth. So forth. And as we all know, um, not collecting subsurface utility data or collecting subsurface utility data often interferes with uh, the schedule and operations and so forth. More on the side when we don't collect it and we have an incident or we find something that shouldn't be there or we didn't think was there, um, uh, you know, it's a major problem. Uh, that's why we're all on this um, uh, call today. <clears throat> but um, one of the, you know, one of the other major challenges is that collecting subsurface data or creating a digital twin um, and all the traditional survey that goes on out there requires specialized equipment, uh, software, and, and certain training. Um, so LexModus was created to mitigate all four of these, all five of these major, major issues in the industry. So we've developed a technology suite of both hardware and software that basically make collecting um, surface data, 3D data of assets from LiDAR and imagery uh, extremely easy, very inexpensive, and, ex and extremely fast. Uh, you're just looking at a video here of a large diameter pipeline project in Canada, uh, which I'll give some more examples of uh, in a second. All this is created just in minutes of, of driving down the right away and collecting the data. Um, sorry if the video is getting a little choppy here. That's the nature uh, of the internet. Um, but um, our focus was to develop technology would make it easy for anybody to go out and create a digital twin of their assets. And as we know, the digital twin is the anchor point for all the other uh, attribute data that is collected for the utility. Um, so the system that we, the hardware and the software we created uh, is, is extremely hands-off. Training literally is 15 minutes or less. Um, it takes about 10 minutes to learn how to set up the equipment uh, mechanically, uh, and their equipment doesn't even have an on-off button. You just go out and start collecting data, and you drag and drop it to the cloud, and it's you get fully um, processed point clouds and registered imagery uh, of your assets instantaneously. So there's no software to download. There's no software to learn. Um, we're really trying to democratize the collection of 3D digital twin asset information. Um, we come, we, we bring in uh, not just the hardware and the processing software, we also have visualization capabilities uh, for our customers so uh, they don't have to buy necessarily uh, your traditional GIS or CAD uh, software, or LiDAR software, just to look at LiDAR and do imagery or feature extraction and measurements and things like that. And do it right on their phone in our, in our browser application. But pretty much most of our customers are similar, you know, are analogous to people on you know, on this call, um, they, they have their own GIS and their own mapping capabilities. So they're just looking for that data to be delivered. That's the majority of our customers. Um, and we provide all of our data in industry, uh, industry standard formats. Um, just quickly, as I mentioned, uh, we started in pipeline, but we're basically in all the infrastructure market verticals, all of which clearly touch um, uh, the utility uh, the utility aspect of, of digital twin. Um, now, I, I've selected some photos here, not all of them have utilities in them, but you can see in the rail example uh, and in the built environment example, there's, there's service utilities. And obviously, um, you can see that um, our technology is used to collect subsurface data as well. Um, but our technology is used for above ground data collection. So, you know, part of, of subsurface mapping is mapping what's above ground, the power lines, the poles, the conduits running down the pole into the ground, you know, the, um, the control boxes for lights, and power boxes intersections, um, you know, the, the pedestals for telco, um, all that kind of information can easily be collected and somewhat automatically extracted from, from imagery and uh, point clouds from, from our system. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're in other market verticals as well, but our primary focus is on power lines, uh, rail and, and pipelines um, and supporting uh, subsurface utility. Uh, our system collects um, all ultra high resolution point clouds um, and um, extremely high resolution imagery. All the images you actually see the, the one digger there and, and the tank battery right there are collected automatically from uh, cameras on, on our devices that are 
that are also geo-referenced. Um, so to that point, um, one of the values of our technology that we bring to the industry, while you're, you know, you're building an asset or you're, it's, a, it's a brownfield piece of work, say you're doing a dig and repair, um, our survey customer partners often use our technology just to capture the information of the dig and repair of what they found, uh, but it's also used to create the actual digital twin of the asset here construction to support the overall as building process. Uh, a key part of that is the ultra high resolution imagery uh, that our system um, provides. Here's an example of the two, the two images on, on the right of the screen, um, the upper images of the LiDAR of one location, um, and the image below that is actually a camera from our camera system, collecting the high resolution imagery of that exact location, the LiDAR uh, as well. Uh, you can see the resolution of our images. Um, when the when our system is close enough to the target, we can actually automatically read barcodes and QR codes um, off material as well, um, and and automatically geospatially index those uh, for customers for attribution. So um, for, for survey partners out there, one of the biggest values they see in our technology is um, uh, just the QC of attribution from construction in the field. That if they forget something or something isn't, isn't typed in correctly, or hey, they're missing some welds somewhere. Uh, they can always go back to the imagery and um, look things up. You can read the stenciling on pipe. You can see the kind of coding you have on conduit. You can see the type of joints that conduit put together with. Uh, all that improve the overall attribution. We already have documented cases of saving our customers, uh, several of our customers, millions of dollars um, just from attribution uh, cor correction in as built alone. Uh, just another uh, Piece of eye candy here. That these are three images of the taxi plot. The one on the left is obviously from the camera, um, and the one on the right is the intensity and IR uh, lidar value. So we are a strategic partner with uh, Ouster, which is uh, one of the world's leading uh, lidar manufacturers. And one of the benefits of Ouster, and the reason we went with them, one of the reasons we went with them is being a pure digital lidar uh, system. But also, in addition to collecting the intensity value and the return, their system also collects ambient IR value, um, which is the image on the, the top image on the right here. So you get both intensity and you get ambient IR from the ouster sensor, which through digital signal processing uh, can add um, a lot of value to automated feature extraction and object recognition technology. So just quickly on, on some outputs, uh, most of our customers, as I mentioned, and partners have their own GIS departments and geospatial CAD capabilities, but often we get asked to provide that as well. All of our data is provided in industry standard format, so it can go into a GIS, such as the image on the left. Um, you know, the images can be mosaic, and you have images of that's a six-inch natural gas pipeline. Um, the image on the right, uh, LiDAR, that's a um, 24-inch um, gas uh, pipeline as well, undergoing a, a creek, actually, in that image. And then the image on the right, and this, the bottom right, um, I guess, do I have a pointer? I don't know if I have a pointer or not, but... Um, is you know crossings from a major construction project in, in northern British Columbia. So another one of the benefits uh, to our large operator partners, customers, is the fact that we help them with crossing management, which is obviously part and parcel to to suit, right? So um, that's the ultimate theme I want to uh, leave with you here. And here's an example of a crossing that was discovered in northern British BC, which didn't exist in any as built out there. Um, the ability to collect, um, I think one of the things that's going to help the, with Sue uh, going forward is automated um, updates uh, of data via, you know, automated, automated processing. So coming across a crossing like this, where clearly in the point cloud, um, technology can be used to automatically calculate the depth of cover, the clearance from the pipe going underneath it um, to the bottom of the, the pipe being crossed, uh, the geospatial location and the, and the azimuth of the pipe, um, you know, th that can all be automated. Uh, and to some degree, there's there's people out there working on automating that kind of technology right now. Um, so to to both previous um, uh, presenters in, in Wes in particular mentioned that you know subsurface utilities are not going away. Uh, we're only adding to them. Um, you know, one of the ways to to, to do uh, um, attrition just update the data that's out there will be through automatic data collection and automatic updates during greenfield and brown. Build uh, construction projects, and that's one of the things that our technology uh, brings to the table. So I think, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I look forward to the panel discussion. I'll stop sharing. Stop sharing. And if um, Jason, if you want to turn on uh, your screen, um, our next presenter is uh, Jason, who I've known for a number of years, um, and I'm looking forward to meeting his um, colleague here on this on this panel. 
Jason is with GTI, uh, the Gas Technology Institute in the U.S. Yes, um, right. and, I, and thank you, Joseph. Uh, appreciate Forward the introduction. <laughs> um, I'm also going to let Simeon share his screen. Uh, he's my coworker here at GTI Energy, and uh, we'll just give a real uh, brief uh, intro on who we are and a couple things that might relate to uh, this discussion today. So, Simeon. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Simeon Cable. I'm um, senior GNSS specialist over at uh, GTI Energy. And uh, we don't have a, a watch presentation. Um, everything so far was uh, was awesome. Uh, thanks for having us today. I know the presentations that we, we've seen so far are, are great. Um, just a brief introduction about uh, who the company is and what we do there. Um, GDI Energy is a research independent not-for-profit organization. Uh, we were established in the natural gas industry about 80 years ago, and um, we went through rebranding uh, just recently this year and moving more and in transitioning into support of the low carbon and low cost energy systems for, for the future of our energy. Um, we have um, uh, headquarters in the Chicago area. This is where I'm and Jason were located, but uh, five other satellite offices uh, across the country and uh, about 28 uh, laboratories um, over there as well. So um, we do research in all aspects of the energy spectrum, uh, anywhere from um, the downhaul to down to the you know, burner tip in, in the houses. Um, so, uh, conversion and supply and delivery and utilization, uh, so a huge portfolio of, of research. Um, we work with a number of um, stakeholders in the industry, obviously federal and state governmental agencies, uh, local utilities, both uh, gas, electric, uh, technology uh, providers, uh, equipment manufacturers, and infrastructure operators and um, pretty much everyone who's uh, playing in the industry. Um, so again, the, the, the main vision for the future for, for a company is um, moving into that low carbon, uh, low emission, uh, low cost energy systems. Um, I'm gonna move to the next slide. So uh, we obviously work in hundreds of different efforts uh, simultaneously, but just to highlight a couple of things related to the underground industry, um, uh, we have several projects going on that uh, we do technology evaluation and development and partnering with technology providers for uh, subsurface utility locating. Um, uh, what you see on the slide is one of those projects where we did um, locating, uh, testing of locates that can provide mapping. They either have integrated uh, high accuracy GNSS or they have uh, uh, other mapping capabilities uh, or they use some external software for that. But either way, um, there's uh, a, a lot of systems out there today that can do those kinds of mapping activities. So at the same time, the, the locate is performed. Uh, instead of putting spray paint on the on the ground, you can actually put it on, on a GIS or CAT or whatever mapping system uh, the company is using. So we did extensive testing on those. Um, what you see in the middle of the slide is uh, um, a baseline that uh, we established uh, last year. It's in our so-called pipe farm area in our campus in Chicago. Uh, we've uh, laid down pipe and uh, we mapped it with high accuracy, uh, scanned it, even fluid drones and everything we, we can to establish a high accuracy location of the pipe. And then we buried it and we performed testing of these technologies, not only EM located, but also GPRs and other uh, technologies that are currently in development. Um, and we also did testing around the country. There's a couple of pictures on, on sites from from our utility uh, customers in different uh, parts of the United States. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we achieve uh, results and we provide uh, accuracy measurements of the final data that's being captured from, from these devices. Um, I don't have that on the slide, but we also have an extensive GNSS testing program. And 
Um, it's uh, it's something that I'm actually involved with for um, about four years now. Uh, it's called GNSS Consortium. We evaluate GNSS technologies and we uh, provide non-biased opinion to, to our customers of how they perform, what's the accuracy, what's the um, um, performance and the real world um, um, experiences you can, you can see with these devices. And that uh, rolls back a little bit to what uh, Nicholas was, was saying about precision and accuracy and understanding uh, what what is that one centimeter tell you? How how you know realistically how is it achievable and what devices can can do it? Um, and for the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Jason uh, to just highlight a couple more uh, projects that we're working on. Yeah, thanks, Simeon. So kind of playing off a little bit of what uh, uh, Simeon was showing with the uh, high accuracy data collection from above ground with utility locators, EM and GPR. Uh, on the left side of uh, our slide here, we actually uh, have a project with this California Energy Commission. They have interest in seeing visualization of these um, assets underground in real time. So we actually created an application to uh, collect points and lines in 2D and 3D. Uh, in real time, Bluetooth streams from locate devices, some paired with high accuracy uh, devices separately, or some are actually uh, have their own in, in embedded uh, antennas and, and, and what have you. So um, kind of a little image of some of the points and lines in 3D to the right of our data collection form. And then down below is sort of actually taking a little bit more of that look of um, what what do we have underground? You know, uh, this is just some sewer data that came from uh, local government and mapping that with the inverts. And then the yellow line is actually a gas line. But when we think about digital twin, you know, a little bit can happen from above ground and we have our plus or minuses we have to be careful of in the Z dimension as well. But um, we also have open trench data collection, other efforts that are grabbing all the assets, the barcodes and everything and planting that into the ground prior to uh, being backfilled. So that's what that's representing actually. So you can kind of think about all these different facets of um, how you get your data and then a little bit of that quality level for sure of if just because we can do it you know and it's there and it's our GIS we need to make sure we have some wrapping around that to, to ensure that we have some of these accuracy levels uh, denoted on our data so that was one project that we're kind of um, still working through with some uh, pilots in California and uh, collecting a couple miles of pipeline in, 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 in real time so um, a little uh, part on the right-hand side actually is uh, our uh, research efforts to kind of um, look at that open trench uh, scanning scenario. So this is actually working alongside Lux Modus and utilizing their scanners uh, on the side of a truck. And we also put it on side of an electric push cart, did some testing here in an open trench at our campus, uh, plus a local uh, utility sponsor in the state of Illinois. And those are just some of the products that we get from the LiDAR point clouds. Um, but what we're trying to do on top of that is um, the great products that come out of Lux that go right into GIS. We have the pipe dimension in 2D, 3D, um, but we don't have for local distribution lines are all the components in between. So what we started testing with uh, image extraction uh, or feature extraction from um, you know, imagery. So we kind of think about LiDAR allowing us to extract some of the, the pipe and, and create a center line. Then we have to think about all the other uh, components in the ground, such as uh, examples here where two pieces of pipe are fused together like a weld and steel would be a butt fusion in plastic. And so we were we were building a, a library and testing it out so we can kind of marry the scan data and give it some more uh, information to kind of start to fill out that digital twin. No barcodes yet, but the idea would be to build a library of these components so the images can pick them up and actually extract them into GIS features and then uh, uh, smash them in there with all the other great extractions that come from uh, products like Lux LuxModus. And we start to build uh, a little more um, of this uh, uh, picture of what's going on underground with the one pass system, a lot more automation, less uh, time around the trench. Uh, less uh, fat finger data entry issues. Um, but then again, this has got a long way to go, but it's uh, a, a nice segue into some of the work we're doing in, into uh, representing the underground digital twin. So um, those are the slides we have. And I think that at this point, we are gonna turn it back to Prashant. I think we're going into the open panel discussion. Great. Well, thank you very much to all of the panelists for absolutely excellent presentations. I um, always come away from these events just blown away by the work that everybody is doing. I think 
there was a point at which when we were organizing the panel session that I was asked to provide some comments around what I thought the role of industry was going to be in this area. And I think, as you can see by the, the variety of different types of presentations and the different types of products and services that are being delivered, as well as the policy intent and the policy rationale behind them, I think it's that old uh, answer about, uh, you know, what are the impacts from the French Revolution? And the answer is generally, it's too soon to tell. So I really do think it's too, too soon to tell. I think there are opportunities for a lot of work to be done in the area. And um, it, it seems like there is a significant opportunity for any private sector company to help define the future. With that in mind, I'd like to open this up for, um, for some discussions. We are going to go forward uh, and, and take a little more time than, than we have as we the, the, the presentations haven't gone on for a while. So we do have a bit of time to, uh, to cheat a little bit. And I invite the panelists back on and I see them coming back on. And with that, I noticed that our Q&As have been quite active. And I did want to try to get some of them answered. One from Connie Barrett, who asks, uh, and I believe this would be for, um, for Bad Elf, uh, and that is, how are the differences in data being addressed when data is being collected in large geographic areas? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think a, a couple of these questions actually are sort of merged all together. Um, so... Let me go ahead and start by saying what I was discussing is called a GNSS. So it's a glo global navigation satellite system. It's not just GPS. GPS is a single constellation of satellite uh, where we are accessing a quad constellation of satellites. And actually to get a higher accuracy, we're actually connecting into an RTK. So a real-time kinematic network, or we're setting up a base and rover UHF connection. So when you tap into most RTK networks in the United States, immediately the datum that's gonna be used uh, most normally is NAT83 uh, Realization 2011 GCS, and that's what they're being broadcast in. Bad Elf then takes that native uh, information via the NEMA stream, and we can parse that out to any software you'd like, whether it's a heavy survey software or a GIS software, and then you can do any transformations you would like on that. As part of that metadata that we send to those apps or our own app uh, includes timestamps. So there's a very real question here that, as most of you probably know, that this year we were supposed to have in the United States a new datum. So NAT83 or NAT83, the North American datum being almost you know 40 years old now, was supposed to be replaced by the North American Terrestrial Reference Frame, so NATREF. Obviously, COVID threw a wrench in things, and so it slowed this down. NATREF is a dynamic datum that accounts for tectonic shift. So when you want to talk about that, we are actually moving around. So we now get a timestamp with that, and we're accounting for the fact that we are moving on this rock, uh, uh, you know, kind of dynamically. And so I just want to be uh, everyone to know that we at Bad Elf are 100% ready for that transition when that comes out. We're just waiting on the government, and that sort of ends it with... What datums are we using? Well, if you are using a Bad Elf device without an RTK, you're going to be using WGS1984, which is technically ITRF08, uh, very, very close. Um, if you're connecting into an RTK, you're NAT83 2011. Then most people, depending on where they are, will then project that to a local coordinate system like a state plane, where you're where you're going one step further, and then. It's really custom. If you've got a transmission line that's a thousand miles long, we sit down a lot of times with our customers and we we plot it out with them. Let's talk about what would be the best way to have a web map, to have local maps, right? So you're having that reduction in tearing and shearing and all of those issues. So a lot of it is consultation with our customer. We just don't hand the hardware over. We say, let's let's put together a plan that's going to work the best for your project. That's a long way to answer, but sort of wraps all, a lot of those questions together. Hopefully that helps. That's great, Nick. And I think the one other thing that I would just add on to that is that NAD also governs uh, Canada and, uh, and Mexico as well. So there are uh, continental interests in that, uh, in that question, as well as in the changeover that is coming with, with NAD rep. Um, we have uh, one other question, or 
I think this is more of a comment around horizontal accuracy. And uh, one of our uh, participants in the audience has said that, uh, has urged us not to say that GPS is one centimeter or less in accuracy and that post-process static GPS is capable of one centimeter at one sigma with properly designed network. Um, does anybody want to comment on that from a technical uh, perspective in terms of uh, your applications and uh, how, how, you've, um, how you've addressed that issue? I can take that question. Um, well, just uh, to uh, uh, piggyback on what uh, Nicholas just uh, mentioned, uh, with the new uh, reference frames that are being designed, um, it's going to be a big challenge for the industry uh, to 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 utilize that. But I think we need to all work together and and get that uh, move to that dynamic frame because you know my my background is geodesy and geophysics, and I'm getting you know uh, my you know. Uh, Buffalo gets a, a little pressurized when I start talking about this topic, but um, th this one centimeter thing uh, is just unthinkable in the global scale if we don't uh, take into account all of these uh, things that are dynamically changing on a daily basis. And I'm not talking about datum shifts, but and tectonic activities, but there's uh, geopotential uh, changes there too that changes the, the elevation, which is uh, uh, the core of our geoid model. And um, uh, when, when we want to go to that global precision of, of that centimeter grade, everything is, is very, um, uh, very important. Every single component, the height of your pole, the, the tilting of your pole, the, uh, um, uh, the, the face center of your, the offset of your face center um, of the antenna and um, the, the, the quality of your depth reading, let's say if you're doing a low, low K, the quality of your depth reading and, um, and all of that. And um, it's uh, very, very important to, to think about all this at all times from, you know, from the surveying perspective, you know, uh, surveyors, uh, including myself, we, we love to have like one coordinate, one monument that never changes. And we take that uh, coordinate and we use it as a reference all the time. But in reality, as, as Nick, Nick mentioned, that there, that's just not um, the truth. It, everything is, is shifting and changing and everyone needs to be uh, aware of that and taking that into account. You're, you're on mute, Deshaun. I just want Joseph to jump in as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Deshaun. Um, re really good comment. Uh, I, I, well, what, I'm just going to put a little bit of a bend up there. I don't want to cause a controversy, which is is actually in a self leading statement. But, um, you know, everyone on this call, and I think most people tuning in are practitioners, right? And we're engineers, we're geographers, we're geologists, and so forth. Uh, and we love the one centimeter discussion. Um, but I just would put to people to keep in mind, and this is maybe an interesting perspective or just me getting old, um, but uh, to, to be pragmatic as well and, and practical because um, one centimeter accuracy is great. Um, keep in mind a lot of the materials we put in the ground um, that when they get cooled, you know, over distance, they contract by several centimeters. The ground shifts, people move, the earth subsides, you have a flood, it gets wet. So I, I, I agree that we should always strive for the best position we have. Um, we're talking to ourselves, the end customers, the person, as mentioned in an earlier example, looking to put in the sprinkler system in their yard, doesn't care about the actual precision of <clears throat> uh, how accurate that one centimeter is in the X, Y, and Z, but they're interested in the relative accuracy that, you know, no matter where the X, Y, and Z actually is, as long as relative, relativistically, where I want to put my sprinkler tube or conduit is this far away from the fence post I have to put on the ground. That's all that matters. It doesn't actually matter what the X, Y, and Z is. I know that's just one example, but as we're trying to provide solution for the public and the people that could, we, we have to keep in mind too that there's, you know, I'm not trying to say we should shoot for less, we should shoot for the best, but let's not cut off our nose in spite of our face, okay? Like the most important thing is relative. Now I know there's legal components, where's the curve and all this other stuff, but you know, pretty much everything we talked about, we're talking about here, literally talking about subsurface buried days to weeks after it's buried, it's moved. Okay, it's moving centimeters here, it's expanding, contracting. A pipeline, it's, it's hilarious how we, when we do natural gas and we survey in where the pipeline is, 
as soon as it's under pressure, it's moved and it's expanded. So one centimeter is not really, you know, we don't want to spend too much time or money or make things uneconomical trying to go for that one centimeter. I think our biggest challenge in Sioux is a collecting data, maintaining, and keeping it current, but also putting the data in the hands of the people who actually need it out in the field and are building their fence, like that guy who hit the fence post or was putting the fence post in the ground in that great video. Luckily, he survived, but he hit a gas line. Relativistic, you know, for the end user is probably the bigger issue, and the data has to be current and accurate, but it doesn't have to be one centimeter all the time. I just put that out there. We are not the consumers of this data. We're, we're the practitioners of the data. The public is the consumer of the data. You have to look at it. That is, that's fantastic. It reminds me of some of the work that uh, that was done in, in previous decades around things like spatial data infrastructure with respect to the collection of, of information and data and how it should really be closest to source and based on user needs, on specific user needs. So that's uh, uh, a really welcome uh, intervention, Joe. Um, one of the things that, you know, the, the, this discussion uh, has really raised for me is the fact that you, all of you are doing some really fantastic work in terms of visualization and representation of the digital twin. Uh, to me, it seems that it is more than a buzzword, but in terms of what the industry and what your clients are saying, is this something that you're using in your vocabulary? as you're going out and engaging with clients, or is this really very much more uh, op- you know, uh, business as usual? Um, and at this point, uh, I'd love for uh, our poll to jump out uh, and see what the audience thinks about this while, uh, while we listen to, to some perspectives. And uh, given we've had Joe and Nick uh, jump in a little bit, I'd, I'd love to invite uh, uh, Wes and, uh, and Jamie. Uh, to uh, to comment first. Prashant, do you want to comment after the poll data comes in, or uh, let's 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 have people fill out the polls and yeah, keep talking as we go along. Uh, sorry, J- not Jamie, Jason. Yeah, sure. Did did you want me to share, Prashant? Sure. Um. So. At- from a Sioux and geospatial provider right now, we're not, we're not getting uh, multiple requests a day, let's say right now to produce a digital twin. What we are getting a lot of increased requests for in our scope of services is to provide 3D modeling of the underground utility map. 2D just doesn't cut it anymore. Uh, the client wants it. So the methods are out there, the new standard is out there to, to move that way. So um, we're not, we're not, you know, the digital twin buzzword. Um, it, it is something that's slowly coming into uh, Sue. It, it's not necessarily a, a scope right now, but the new standard leans towards it and absolutely allows for it in the capture of the data that is subsurface utility engineering. Um, and I think, I think the requests are going to come in more because these 3D models just sitting out there by themselves don't do a lot of good unless they're not smart models and have data to them. You know, you can click on that building and you can get information from it. We're already there with GIS. Um, so why not have a 3D model that also has that? So that, that's my thought from the Sioux and geospatial provider. Great. Jason? Yeah. Um, buzzword. Yeah. I think it's also been around for a long time. Um, and maybe people can consider maybe different tiers of what they want to believe is a digital twin. Um, it, 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 a simple stage. Yeah. Like Wes said, getting things into a GIS system. Now we have 2D. We have availability to do 3D. We do it in real time. We can make kind of a representation. We can scan barcodes. We could tell you exactly where those fusions are when you need to dig them up for regulation sake. Um, all that metadata that goes along with it. But then you start thinking about people trying to put the 3D visualization on steroids and saying, well, let's get the dimensions of what that 3D feature actually looks like. Let's add an IoT sensor to it. Let's build this model, as you saw. I think, uh, Wes, you might have had it in your water model um, through Esri. That's sort of what I would say the future can be, but I think it's starting from a little bit of um, these representations and building up. Everybody's going to have a little bit different flavor 
of what they think they want to digitally record in different dimensions and then slowly build to create this infrastructure. I just think it's going to take a little bit of time. And, and, and at least with our sponsors, some people are not ready for that. They're still trying to figure out their own solutions. Even in a 2D world, they don't always even love the 3D environment because they can't keep it up to snuff over time. So they don't want to collect that third dimension. People don't want to, with locators, even mark the ground for sake of uh, being accountable. But um, will that change? You know, And I think in the United States versus other places, we, we do need to start sharing that data too. And we need to hold it up to some standard, which you know, hopefully Sue can help us do. And we can start to get towards these um, schemas that are somewhat uh, similar across the many different platforms of data collection, kind of like you have with NEMA and GNSS and things like that. And we start to build upon how we, these efforts of the people on the panel earlier are all going to come together to regulate this. And so you don't just build it and they come and you can do it. You have to have some accountability behind it and what those levels actually mean. So you can pre-plan and do construction properly. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, one of the things that I'd also like to um, bring in is the concept of a digital twin. And when you have virtualized environments, um, is there going to be a difference? And Earl Burkholder uh, uh, talks about the elephant in the room. And the fact is that there's a difference between true 3D and pseudo 3D. And whether that is something that the end user is going to be concerned with and whether this issue of accuracy gets thrown into the mix in terms of the, the true 3D and pseudo 3D representations. And how about I just throw this out there to, uh, to Joe and, uh, and Simeon. We seem to have lost Joseph. He may have dropped off suddenly. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, you're here. <laughs> well, Nick, do you want to take a stab at it? Or, did you say me? Um, yeah. So I, 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 I haven't heard the exact um, the pseudo 3D quote unquote that he's that that's been mentioned. Um, what I do understand is that that. <laughs> We talk about the 3D, right? My my iPhone, uh, well, you can't see it because of the, the screen thing, but my iPhone has a camera and a LiDAR sensor and I can go walk around and I can map out the 3D, right? The reality becomes, or maybe I shouldn't say reality because that becomes a bad joke here, but that device is not highly that accurate in a lot of circumstances. It's not going to have all this technology behind it. And so the three-dimensional modeling that you're producing because of that is going to be very off. Um, it's not necessarily going to be true reality. Um, so I definitely think as these devices get more accurate, you know, when I started about 15 years ago, LIDAR, a LIDAR point cloud was really thick, right? Always. And you just got this massive amount of points that we've had to work through. And you realize at one level, like, having a gajillion sensors and collecting 5 million points is actually overkill. And it's creating more fuzz and noise than you need. And you can run a 32, you know, um, laser sensor instead and run a Kalaman, you know, we've gotten better at it. Uh, so I think yeah. we have to just be very cognizant of what we're doing. And, I, and I'd wrap it in sort of to the last conversation about accuracy, right. And precision, um, this is, in my humble opinion, where we need uh, professionals in the industry, primarily registered land surveyors, uh, registered engineers, people that are going to stamp an authority, like basically say that not, not just the manufactured specs, not just what the client's telling me, not what my thumb is doing in the air, but I've tested it. I've put it through this uh, process. I am confident that it's getting this accuracy under a tree next to a building. I'm confident that my model a mile down the road doesn't have a, a four inch drift. I'm confident that my model where the wall is, is actually where the wall is. It's not three inches recessed because of a thick point cloud. Um, so I really recommend that people vet what they're doing and that they hire professionals that know how to analyze what they're doing so that you can truly qualify um, the technology that you're using, the models that you're making. So I don't know that necessarily answers exactly, but the world is so dynamic. I mean, Simeon mentioned gravity. Gravity changes, right? Like, how do we account for that? So um, hopefully that maybe helps a little. It, it so one, does one help. Thing I wanna, 
Yeah, uh, just I, we are we are nearing the, the five minute zone. There is a couple of a uh, couple of other issues uh, that I did want to to raise. There was a question that Brad Cleaving uh, has, and uh, Nick, I'll get you to answer it, answer this very concisely, and then I'll bring Simeon back so, to make a comment. Um, how do you handle dense canopy in multipath? Very carefully. Um, all <laughs> GPS is going to be suspect to multipath. So if somebody's telling you that their GPS is better and it doesn't get affected or impacted, they're lying to you. Uh, and, and quite frankly, what I'd tell you, if you're in a really bad situation, put your bad elf device away and pull out a total station, right? Like the right tool sometimes needs to be decided. And if you're in downtown New York, that bad elf device, maybe not, may not do it for you. So the helical antenna for us helps with canopy but we're going to be just as much uh, impacted. And that's where an intelligent crew is going to make decisions and use the right tool in that circumstance. And, you know, GPS, GNSS isn't always the right tool. Great. And I would also add everybody, ask everybody to take uh, 30 seconds to finalize your digital twin, because in 30 seconds, I'm going to ask uh, that Anne is, uh, is going to close down and, and close down the poll and then share the results of the poll. And uh, with that, I just want to say uh, how uh, pleased I have been uh, to have shared the stage with uh, all of you on the panel today. Uh, the, the presentations have been absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed them. As the former head of a national mapping agency in Canada, you can, you can figure out how, uh, how these kinds of uh, presentations get me quite excited about uh, the future and about the opportunity. And I guess it really does go back to that original comment about, um, you know, what's the role of industry? Well, it really is too early to tell. And I think, uh, you know, it's really, the future is really unwritten. And with that, can we share the poll results and then uh, go from there? Wow, look at that. Not sure, but I think it's something we want to be involved with. Thirty-one uh, percent. No, it is something we consider. It, it it is something we consider on a daily basis. Wow, forty percent. I find that really surprising. It, really surprising. Yes, it's just a buzzword. Only sixteen percent, and not sure four percent. I guess that shows my own biases. Uh, and does your former Firmer organization consider the digital twin on a normal operational basis. 51% said yes. Wow, really fascinating, really fascinating. So with that, I would also urge all of you to, um, to join the networking session. I would also urge everybody on the, on the call here today to have a look at the WGIC report on uh, digital twins. It's uh, an absolutely superb piece of work. And with that, I will turn it back to, uh, to our host and uh, leader, 